is a short video on hypertension. Hypertension is the technical term for high blood pressure. In this video, I'll be talking about the topics listed down here on the left. We'll talk about some risk factors for hypertension, the definition of hypertension, as well as the stages and how to diagnose it, treatments and drugs for hypertension, complica complications of hypertension, and secondary hypertension. So all of these refer to essential hypertension, and then at the end I'll talk about secondary or other causes of hypertension. So first, an overview. As I said, 95% of cases are termed essential hypertension, which means that there's no single identifiable cause. It's usually a combination of metabolic syndrome and diet and exercise and uh, it creates the vascular problems. The uh, non-essential hypertension would be called secondary hypertension. We'll talk about that at the end. Hypertension is typically called an, a silent killer. It's an asymptomatic disease and it has some pretty serious complications as we'll see, but um, while patients have it, it's something they don't notice. It's asymptomatic, so it's called a silent killer. These are the risk factors for hypertension. Gender, first, both hypertension and its complications are more common in men than women. Race, again, hypertension and its complications are more common in blacks than whites. Age, your risk for hypertension increases as you get older. Metabolic syndrome, including obesity, hyperlipidemia, and sedentary lifestyle, all predispose you to hypertension. Family history, if your parents have hypertension, you're more likely to have hypertension. High sodium intake and high alcohol intake also predispose you to hypertension. So let's go through the definition, the staging. In order to diagnose hypertension, you need two readings at least two weeks apart on two separate visits. And you can also use the home BP monitor uh, for this, the home blood pressure monitor, as part of these two readings. So they don't necessarily need to be two visits, but they need to be two readings on two separate occasions. Um, in the beginning, uh, the very lowest uh, part, of the, uh, part of the chart, we have normal blood pressure, which is defined as a systolic blood pressure less than 120 or a diastolic and a diastolic blood pressure less than 80. Um, there's no treatment for this. You screen again next year when the person comes in for their next physical. Elevated blood pressure, which was previously called prehypertension, is defined as a systolic blood pressure less than 130, so between 120 and 130, and that diastolic criteria is the same. The recommendations for somebody with elevated blood pressure are a uh, low salt diet, then ideally people would have less than 2.4 grams of salt in their diet, which is actually pretty hard to achieve, and to cut out alcohol, um, or to have as little alcohol as possible. Additional suggestions for elevated hypertension are exercise 30 minutes a day and to lose weight if your BMI is above 25. Next, we'll have hypertension stage 1 and hypertension stage 2. Both of these require follow-up after diagnosis. So hypertension stage 1 is up to 140 systolic and up to 90 diastolic. If you have either of these, you have stage one hypertension. The treatment here is the same above. So we're gonna, we're gonna recommend diet, exercise, and weight loss for everybody, plus one med if you're at high risk for coronary artery disease. We'll talk about the medicines in the next slide. Um, and coronary artery, artery disease risk factors include obesity, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. Um, so you can calculate your risk for coronary artery disease using an online calculator. And if it's above 10%, you need to be on a medicine if you have stage one hypertension. Stage two hypertension is up to or, or is, is greater than 140 or greater than 90 diastolic. And again, we're gonna recommend the same treatment, the diet, exercise, lose weight, this time with two medicines. And again, stage one and stage two hypertension both require follow-up after you start those medicines. Next are what is collectively called the hypertensive crises. This is hypertensive urgency and hypertensive emergency. They both have a systolic and diastolic pressure of over 180 or a diastolic of over 120. It's a hypertensive urgency if there are no signs or symptoms of end organ damage. The treatment in this case is to immediately give oral medications to lower blood pressure over 24 hours. Now you don't want to lower the blood pressure immediately, but you want to start the medication as soon as possible and gradually decrease that blood pressure over the first 24 hours. In a hypertensive emergency, uh, you have the same readings, over 180 systolic or over 120 diastolic, 
and you have signs of end organ damage. So this is usually symptoms, including the ones listed here. There's altered mental status, headache, chest pain, shortness of breath, epistaxis or nosebleeds, high troponins, or high creatinine on the blood work. In this case, you want IV infusion of antihypertensive agents, so that's usually requiring admitting the patient to the ICU. Uh, you also want to address the symptoms that they have, the, the symptoms of end organ damage. For instance, if they have a headache, you might want a CT to see if they have uh, a brain bleed or a hemorrhage in the brain. So these are the different stages, and most of them refer to different medicines uh, that need to be taken. So let's talk about those drugs. This is the treatment for hypertension. Um, the initial monotherapy requires administering one of these four drugs. That's in the dark green, so you have a little key up here. Um, one of the drugs is the thiazide diuretics. This includes HCTZ and chlorothalidone. Some side effects of thiazides are decreasing your blood potassium, so hypokalemia. They all of these drugs are also good for other comorbid conditions, and they might have other benefits. So these drugs might be prescribed according to the other conditions that that patient has, the other the comorbid conditions that that patient has. So in the case of thiazide diuretics, you might also uh, you might prescribe it in a patient who also has strokes, who also has CVAs. Um, it also decreases their urinary calcium, so it might be beneficial for somebody who has tip or who has frequent kidney stones. These two kind of fall in one category, the ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers. Those are drugs that end in pril, like lisinopril, um, and drugs that end in sartan, like lasartan. And they kind of come together because they uh, act on the same pathway, the renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone uh, pathway. And they, uh, so you should not use them together. That's something to note. You don't want to use ACE inhibitors and ARBs together. Um, they have similar side effects. They increase creatinine and they increase blood potassium, with the exception that ACE inhibitors also cause dry cough and angioedema. Angiotensin receptor blockers do not cause that dry cough or angioedema. These two both have protective effects on the kidneys. Um, they kind of do this by reducing the amount of high blood pressure going to the kidneys. So it's kind of weird that they have a protective effect on the kidneys, but they also increase creatinine. So that's worth noting. Um, because of that protective effect on the kidneys, they're used in chronic kidney disease, diabetes. Um, they're also used in coronary artery, artery disease, congestive heart failure, and cerebrovascular accidents. You don't want to use them in coronary or in, uh, chronic kidney disease stage 4. Um, you don't want to make a patient progress to stage 5 because you gave them an ACE inhibitor. So they're used in earlier stages of chronic kidney disease. Next are these calcium channel blockers. That's what CCB is. Um, specifically the category dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. These are drugs that end in dipine. The side effect they cause is peripheral edema and uh, they are also anti-anginals, so they're good for people who have angina, they're good for people who have coronary artery disease. They also increase calcium resorption in the kidneys, so they could also be beneficial for a patient that has osteoporosis. Next are these drugs that have specialized use, so you might use them specifically for the comorbid conditions, but they're not necessarily first-line initial monotherapy for blood pressure, but they do still have an effect on blood pressure. First is the beta blockers, ending in LOL. They decrease heart rate as a side effect. So if somebody already has a pretty low heart rate, uh, you don't want to give them beta blockers. They also don't work in obstructive lung disease. Beta blockers have the opposite effect of short-acting beta agonists like uh, albuterol inhalers that somebody with asthma might use. So you don't want to give that person a beta blocker um, since it kind of undoes what their asthma medication or what their COPD medication might do. There are specific beta blockers that work particularly well in heart disease. That's metoprolol, carvedilol, and nabivolol. And that works in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, coronary artery disease, and congestive heart failure. And beta blockers are also noted to be safe for pregnancy, whereas you might not want to use some of these other drugs like ACE inhibitors or ARBs in pregnancy. Spironolactone is another drug uh, that increases potassium in the blood, so it can cause a hyperkalemia. It might also cause gynecomastia. This is one of the aldosterone antagonists, and, that, and that's actually the mechanism for which uh, causes gynecomastia. The other aldosterone antagonist is eplerinone, and that also causes a hyperkalemia. These can also be used to treat primary or secondary hyperaldosteronism, and they're also used in congestive heart failure. 
Next, we have these two drugs that dilate your arteries and your veins. That's hydralazine, the arterial dilator, and ISDN, the venodilator. Collectively, these are sold with a brand name Bidil, and they're used in congestive heart failure. Um, they both have anti-anginal effects. So hydralazine is another one that's safe for pregnancy. Nitrates specifically are anti-anginal, um, prevent chest pain, and they're sold together as Bidil for congestive heart failure. Side effects, this hydralazine causes reflex tachycardia, and it, it's also been shown to cause drug-induced lupus. So that's something to look out for. ISDN, by the way, is isosorbide dinitrate. Um, you don't want to use that with other nitrates. So that would be like Viagra. Viagra is one of these drugs that you don't want to use with, uh, with too many nitrates. Lastly, we have these two drugs that might have an effect on blood pressure, but you really don't want to use them for blood pressure. So uh, the yellow ones work for hypertension, um, but you don't want to use it if you don't have this comorbid condition. That's the Zosins, the alpha blockers, uh, and that's used for benign prostatic hyperplasia. It uh, helps older guys usually who have trouble with urinary retention, helps them relax uh, the, the prostate, helps them unblock their ur urinary tract and go to the bathroom. It isn't used frequently for blood pressure because it causes an orthostatic hypotension, which can be pretty dangerous in, in people that have BPH. Another ones that you definitely don't want to use are clonidine, which causes rebound hypertension, the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, that's diltiazem and verapamil. Those really should only be used for rate control in the case of atrial fibrillation. Next, we'll talk about the complications of high blood pressure. Uh, this can happen years to decades after a person has been diagnosed with hypertension. We'll start with the cardiovascular complications. These are the majority of deaths are caused by this, uh, by, in, in this category of cardiovascular. There's firstly coronary artery disease, which can lead to MIs, can lead to heart attacks. There's congestive heart failure, which can lead to left ventricular hypertrophy. And other cardiovascular complications are peripheral artery disease and abdominal aortic aneurysms, which can lead to aortic dissection. Um, so really just any kind of vascular problem can be caused by too high of pressures in the vascular system. There are also brain problems or problems in the central nervous system. High blood pressure can cause strokes, TV, uh, TIAs and CVAs. It can cause intracerebral hemorrhage. It can cause hypertensive encephalopathy, which includes headache, confusion, convulsions. There are some problems in the eye in people who have really high blood pressures for a long time. It can cause hypertensive retinopathy, which includes people having visual disturbances and papilledema. In the blood, generally, it can increase your blood sugar if you have hypertension. And in the kidneys, it can cause hypertensive nephropathy, which leads to chronic renal failure. So, so far, we've been talking about 95% of cases of hypertension, which were called essential hypertension. Those other 5% are due to other processes in the body, and they are collectively known as secondary hypertension. We'll be talking about those, a list of, of things that might cause secondary hypertension. So you want to suspect secondary hypertension in people who have hypertension that is refractory to three or more medications, and in patients that are quite young, that are in less than 35 years old. Now, as the obesity epidemic gets worse, um, this age range might decrease even more. Some people might have primary or essential hypertension at a very young age if they've been overweight and sedentary uh, starting at a very young age. So some causes of secondary hypertension. There's renal, and re uh, there's renal disease and renovascular problems. This is most common cause of secondary hypertension. This includes renal artery stenosis in old men, as well as fibromuscular dysplasia in young women. Um, this diabetes can also cause secondary hypertension, chronic kidney disease, end-stage renal disease, and polycystic kidneys might also increase a person's blood pressure. There are several endocrine causes. We'll go through some of them. Hyperaldosteronism is a cause of secondary hypertension. You would diagnose this by first noticing hypokalemia on a blood test and then taking an A to R ratio. And if that's greater than 20, uh, that's, sorry, angiotensin to renin ratio. And if that's greater than 20, you would suspect hyperaldosteronism. 
hyperthyroidism is another cause of secondary hypertension. You would notice this in a patient who loses weight, who has heat intolerance, who also presents with sweating and palpitations. You can diagnose this by checking the TSH levels or T4 levels. Hypercalcemia can also cause secondary hypertension. The typical saying for this is bones, stones, groans, and psychiatric moans. Um, to diagnose this, you just check free calcium in the blood. Cushing's syndrome can also present with secondary hypertension. Um, this is classically seen as a person with central, central obesity, moon facies, diabetes. And to diagnose this, you might do a dexamethasone suppression test and uh, then check their ACTH levels. Pheochromocytoma is another cause of secondary hypertension. This is diagnosed uh, in a person that has palpitations, pallor, pain, perspiration, and pressure. So remember all those P's for pheochromocytoma. This is diagnosed by checking 24-hour urine metanephrines. So to see if they're actually producing all those metanephrines, you check their urine for 24 hours. In acromegaly, people with big hands, feet, face, and heart, uh, they might also have secondary hypertension. You can diagnose this by checking blood levels of IGF-1, that's insulin-like growth factor 1, and you can also do a glucose suppression test. There are several medications that might cause hypertension, including OCPs and estrogen, as well as decongestants and some appetite suppressants, steroids, tricyclic antidepressants, and NSAIDs for pain. Coarctation of the aorta causes secondary hypertension. In kids, this might present as uh, having warm extremities up top, but cold legs, so warm arms, cold legs. Um, it's also pretty painful in kids. In adults, you might notice notching. You also notice a blood pressure differential, so an extremely different blood pressure when measured in the arm versus measured in the leg. And in both those cases, you can diagnose it by doing a chest x-ray or a CT angiogram. Cocaine and other stimulants also cause secondary hypertension. You diagnose that by doing a drug test. And lastly, people with obstructive sleep apnea uh, might have a secondary hypertension. These are people that are usually uh, obese or they're sleepy, daytime somnolent, so they're sleepy during the day. You would diagnose obstructive sleep apnea by doing a, a sleep study. So that's it for this overview of hypertension. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.